Okay, we're going to kind of start over. And there's a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to just start at the beginning and we'll see how far I get. This is really complicated and it's really important. Um, let me first tell you why it's important because, you know, people don't really want to learn the Bible. They say they do, but they don't. And because of that scholarship, even the scholars don't really want to learn the Bible and their scholarship on the Bible's dates has been really horrible, slipshod. They never go back to the Bible and do the Bible's own timeline. Whereas we laymen, we just look at Genesis 5 and realize, well, there is a timeline. Yeah, there is. But nobody's bothering to really competently add up the numbers. So we're missing the point here of how those so-called boring begats. They're not boring. It's hard to work with the numbers. There's, that's no doubt about that. But this is what the Jewish kids learned, you know, at their mother's knee, which I'm going to show you in the next increment. Because the Jews still do this today. All right, they just have the wrong numbers that they're doing it with. So here's the import. God is measuring time, as I've been saying now for several years, in 10, 50 year increments. What I didn't know when I did that <clears throat> was that he's also measuring 10, 50 year increments on other bases. In other words, I knew that he was measuring 10, 1,000 from Noah's birth to justify continuing time. That's a separate kind of measure. But he's also measuring a 1050 from Noah's birth, which I didn't know until a couple of days ago. All right? So Paul is taking advantage. In other words, like every other Jewish kid, Paul learned this on his mother's knee. He's making an accounting using the Greek anaphora of the Hebrew timeline. The Old Testament timeline showing how church is the summation of history in order to bridge back to Israel. That's the whole point of Ephesians, which you don't know if you don't know the meter. In other words, you're going to misread the book of, of Ephesians and Colossians and Galatians and Hebrews if you don't understand this underlying point. God is showing how the old time is being you know, fulfilled by the new time to bridge back to the old time that didn't quite complete when Christ died. If you have anything other than a pre-trib rapture position, you are so far off base in understanding Bible that you really need to go back to the beginning, which is what I'm going to do here. Noah was born 1056 from Adam. That's where we start. That's what you get if you add up to Genesis 5, Genesis 7 through 11 begats. Okay? That's what you get. Genesis 7 in particular, because that's Noah's birth being talked about when he, his age. All right? He was born. Look at this. Start from the very beginning. He was born six years late. Which means that the guy who matured before him, okay, and the, which is really talking about Adam. Okay, Adam matured 130 years late to start with. Then Lamech came in and he matured, that was when Enoch was born, at the very end of Adam's 490. And I did videos on that so you can go look them up. Okay, Lamech's maturity 490 years from Adam meant that they were still 130 years late. Okay, so God is tracking 1050s as well as 490s from each of these people in the you know roster. He's telling you who they are. The births of their sons signify that they won the 490 or 1050 in this case. And here he's tracking the 1050. Okay, he's born 1056 from Adam's fall. Well, Adam didn't even mature until one until 130 years after. Okay, I don't know who got the first 1050. It was probably Enoch. Okay, so Enoch probably got it, which means that we're much later in the game. But in any event, the first 1050, even though it was met because somebody super matured, Noah was born six years after the first 1050 expired in history. That's the point of the roster. So we have a seven year late already starting. So the point is, is that, okay, well, Adam was late 130 years. 
But by the time we get to Noah's birth, not his maturation, but his birth, because he was born from, I forget the name of his father. Whoever that guy was, he had super matured also. But it's six years after the, the new 1050. So at this point, by the new 1050, when it started, we were only six years over, not 130. That's the point. Sorry this is so complicated. All right? So now it's tracking from Noah's birth. It's tracking from Noah's birth because Noah won a 1050, which is obvious that he won a 1050. And it's measured from the year of his son's birth when he was 500. Okay? It's obvious he won a 1050 since the whole, the whole world started over with him. So it's a no-brainer that he won a 1050. All right. So, so now, because he won a 1050, God is using a different a tracking mechanism that I don't, do not fully understand yet. It's measuring it from Noah's birth. Obviously, it has something to do with the fact that he was born just after a 1050. Okay, that's all I know about it right now. So 1050 after Noah's birth, Jacob is born. And it's tracking to Jacob's birth, so that means Jacob must have won a 1050, which I didn't know until doing these numbers now. So I have a lot of work to redo, you know, on these rules for how God orchestrates time. This is a whole nother set of tracking that God's doing that I didn't know of. And Paul is tracking time from Christ's birth. And and I'm showing the the precedence for that. When Paul writes Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, he's starting the 490 and thus the 1050 over not at Christ's death, but at his birth. Now, I know we can do it at his death, as you're going to see, but it's also measured from birth. Because, see, here's the precedence. It's being measured from birth to the birth, birth to birth. Transaction, <coughs> excuse me, when you're accounting or auditing, you always have to match the character of the transaction. Birth to birth. So if this were a death number, I would have to go death to death, but it's not a death number, it's a birth number. So 1050 from Noah's birth is the birth of Jacob. Now people have trouble understanding how the timeline works because God doesn't just do it by begats. Okay, you know, by the time he gets to, um, I forget who's the last listing in Genesis 5, but he switches in Genesis 7 to Noah. <coughs> Excuse me. It's raining outside. I'm allergic to rain. Okay, but he's going birth to birth here. All right. I show in Brain Out Fact, number 6A, where I get the Bible verses that tell me what years all these things happen. So you can look them up in the Bible yourself. Okay. All I'm doing is, is compiling the information. It's in the Bible. This is not brain out doing anything. This is not a scholar doing anything. This is not an estimate. These are Bible verses. So you can check my math. If you see something different, let me know. Okay? 1050 from Noah's birth is a way God measures time. And Jacob is born at that time. So there was some kind of deadline for Jacob's birth. And Jacob wasn't even born until Isaac, Isaac was 60. And Isaac and Rebecca wondered why they couldn't have kids. Well, they couldn't have kids because God's timing is birth. Obviously. All right? God timed it. God timed the birth of Isaac. God timed the birth of everybody. Your, your birth was timed. Just because these are the heroes in the Bible doesn't mean that, you know, you're left out. If he's going to do it for them, he's going to do it for you. The same love he has for Christ, he also has for you. Okay? So, that's what you have to keep in mind here. I'm sorry I'm spending so much time on this, but it's the principle of the thing. Okay, so now it becomes easier to understand that now he's measuring another 1050 from Jacob's birth. Get this, to the dedication of the temple. That's a birth also. It's birth that goes into existence. That's 3156 from Adam. It, David was dead at this point. That's temple year one. And all these other dates are based on temple years, foundation or dedication. This is dedication. Temple was um, 
construction began actually 10 years prior to the dedication date. That's in 1 Kings 6 1. But God is measuring time like this, He's benchmarking it. And you only know that if you plot all the numbers. And you only know that if you plot all the numbers from Bible, not from scholar estimates, not from astrology or astronomy, where you're guessing at eclipses and all the other nonsense that scholars go through. Okay, it's dumb. Don't do that. Eclipses occur three times a year. You, you, you know, and besides the Romans, when they talk, you know, Josephus talks about, oh, there was an eclipse just prior to Herod dying. Yeah, so? That's what Romans always wanted to say. The Romans always wanted to say that great people had supernatural occurrences in the sky to announce that they were going to become Caesar or to announce that they were going to die or to announce somebody's going to be born. You know, they always use the signs in the sky, which the Bible prohibits. There was no star of Bethlehem. It's prohibited under Deuteronomy 18. God never says there's a star over Bethlehem. God never says there's a star of any kind anywhere at Christ's birth there was an angel that's in Matthew 1 and Luke plays on it in Luke 1 stars don't hover over houses and there was never any star or angel over the manger I'm crying out loud if people would just read the Bible they'd know this year 1050 from Jacob's birth temple dedicated you got that so here's another 1015. This one is real important to Paul's accounting. Year 1050 from Abraham's supermaturation, which was 2046 from Adam. Okay. Is Isaac's birth at that year. A thousand years, 1050 after that, David's crowned in Hebron. Now look, this is really important. I need to go back one, two. The temple was dedicated in Exodus year 490. What I need to determine is, well, did God tell Solomon to wait that long? Because the temple had been con under construction 10 years prior. It only took seven years to complete it. So Solomon's waiting an extra three years. He first waited three years until David died before he started construction. Okay, see, we got a seven year lateness in time here. When Solomon waits, he waits, total of an additional seven years before he dedicates the temple. So now we got a 14. This is the origin of the 14 that gave rise to the tribulation. First here, and then Solomon waited three years to even begin construction after David died. That's 1 Kings 6, 1. And then he waited another three years to dedicate it. That's 1 Kings 9. And that ends up being Exodus year 490. Remember the 490s are important. The scholars don't even know about this because they didn't do the timeline. When Daniel is told in Daniel 9, 490 years, why didn't some scholars say, hey, wait a minute. Daniel's not asking any questions there. So God's talking to Daniel in a language about time that Daniel already knows. Well, where is this language about time? Go back and do the begets. That's what occurred to me when I read the verse. And I'm a brain out. Why didn't it occur to any of the scholars or the teachers or the pastors or anybody else? And of course, three years after I came up with this, John Hagee came up with his own version, but his own version doesn't, doesn't do what he should do. His version is completely wrong. He's going based on the political resuscitation of Israel and his idea in 1948, and then he builds his 490s backwards. That's not how God does it. You see, I'm, I'm sorry to yell, but, you know, I got other things to do with my life. And God's giving this to a brain out, so it means that even a brain out can understand it. So why aren't the scholars understanding it? Why aren't the pastors teaching this? The Jews used to know this because Paul's relying on Jewish knowledge when he constructs his anaphora that reveals all these hubs. That's where I'm getting it from, and I'm a brain out. Why don't the scholars know? I'm sorry to be so harsh, but you know what? If a brain out can do it, then how come 2,000 years of scholarship in Christianity has gone by and they don't know this? And how come the Jews don't know it? So shame on you, Jews and Christians. Now let's get back to the topic. Exodus year 490. There was a deadline. 490 years 
from the Exodus. This is already a deadline. From the Exodus, the temple had to be dedicated. Solomon obviously waited that long. So now we got 14 years over, as you're going to see. See, the temple's dedicated 3156. Actually, no, that's still seven years over. I'm sorry. That's still seven years over. Look, 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 look. You know, I'm, I'm looking at this too. 3150 is the third um, 1050 from Adam. Okay? Here is the first 1050 from Adam. So there are 2,000 years between this date and this date. See how much orchestration is going on? But this is still seven years late. The third 1050 from Adam ended 3150. So this initial seven is still in abeyance. We got a loss here. We got, when it says six, it means seven. Okay, we got a loss here of seven years. All right? When, when you say 56, it means in the 57th year. It's beginning the 57th year. See, when we do things in our numbers, when you're age 56, you've just begun your 57th year. 56 means that you're at the end of a year. 57 means you're at the beginning of a year. Okay? So we're seven years, we're coming up on seven years late, at the beginning of the seventh year late. Exodus year 490. Okay? And that an exodus occurred in Aviv, and the temple is dedicated in Ethanim, so it's, you know, six months into the year. So it is seven years late. Okay, there you go. That's the time story that's being told here. And from the flood, 1500. Now look at this, 1050 from Abram, David is crowned king of Hebron. Why did that matter? First of all, it's Exodus year 430, 60 years prior. Exodus years 430 is a play on, deliberate, play on. <clears throat> the 430 years to the day that Israel lived in Egypt. In other words, it, Israel went into Egypt, was there for 430 years, the last, 400, last 390 of them were slavery years. You, it becomes 400 when you tack on Joseph's extra 10. That's how the Bible timeline works. And scholars don't know that either, so they never get this right. Jacob was born 400, I mean, David was crowned king in Hebron 430 years after the total time that Israel was in Exodus. That's, a, that's God's making a point there. I hope you get it. Hi, you went, into, you went into a foreign land, okay, and I delivered you out 430 years later. Now I'm delivering you again another 430 years later by crowning David king in Hebron. <clears throat> now there's more to that story which we're going to get to okay because um, Saul was appointed king first he was appointed king because Israel rejected God as king and that becomes an issue in deciding when the tribulation will occur as we're going to see later okay but notice this first okay now look so therefore a thousand years from his Hebron kingship is Exodus year 1430. That brings us into the timeline of the Lord. Okay, year 1000 from David's united kingship, which occurred seven years later, the Lord is born. Okay, so that's Exodus year 1430. All right, now look, this is what I said was going to be important. Year 1050, after Israel rejected God as king and therefore appointed Saul, God appointed Saul, okay, is 4103 from Adam. That's the same year as the Lord is born. Now, this particular thing is stressed by Moses in Psalm 90. Okay? Psalm 90 bookend, Psalm, Moses writes Psalm 90 in the 1050th anniversary of the flood. And you know that because of his meter. The first seventh paragraph is a dateline about when the writer writes. 
And it, it happens a lot in scripture. It's just that the scholars don't know that the Bible Hebrew even has meter. Because they're thinking that meter ought to rhyme or have a cadence. All right? They're, they, they, you know, they didn't count the syllables like the Jews had to do. So they don't, under, they don't notice that there's a sevening pattern that goes on in these numbers, especially in prophecy, which Psalm 90 is. Okay, it's a statement of, it's, that has a lot of functions. Okay, he writes it in the 1050, actually the beginning of the 1051st year after the flood. And he's writing at the, he ends it at the beginning of the 1051st year before Messiah is born. In other words, it's and 1050 and 1050. <clears throat> so Messiah is born at the 1050th year after Psalm 90 ends. Psalm 90 itself is 350 years, and it's also 5,250 years. Mo Moses is a counting time on two time tracks. The book of Judges is 350 years going, you know, dating back to Psalm 90, showing how Psalm 90 got fulfilled. Okay? It's very complicated. The point is, is that it's complicated, and the point is that you can still know it, because I'm just a brain out. So Moses is bookending Psalm 90 between the 1050th anniversary of the flood and the 1050th future anniversary of Messiah. Okay? So, Messiah is born on that anniversary just like Moses predicted he would be. See how clever that is? Okay, so I'm going to stop here and then we'll resume in the next increment. Well, no, the next increment I'm going to show you how Jews account time so you'll realize that this accounting here is something very common. Okay, because you've not heard of it before, and neither has most of Christendom. But this accounting really is very common and still persists among Jews today. That'll be the next increment, and then after that I'm going to resume right here. Okay.